Okay, hey everybody. So now that you've all finished the second test, we are moving to the final one third of our course. So let's take a step back and see where we've come, come from. The first one third of our class was on language and rhetoric. And that's because we wanted to be able to understand and clarify our claims. Okay, and to understand how to clarify somebody's claim or our own claims, we got to um, understand language, how it works. We got to understand rhetoric. We got to understand conversational implicatures, um, implicitly relative sentences, quantifiers, and so forth. So that was the first section and uh, toward us becoming good critical thinkers. The second one third of our course was about deduction and what type of arguer you want to be become. That was the first part. So someone who uses the principle of charity, that's uh, following the arguments and evidence where it leads, not just being a dogmatic or, um, or a gullible, credulous person or something like that. Um, but we want to be following the evidence and one way we can follow the evidence is by using arguments and specifically deductive arguments. So we had a whole focused study on deduction, deductive argument forms, validity, and soundness, and so forth. So that was the second one third. In this last one third of our course, we're going to focus on another type of argument. And this is what's called induction. Okay. And we'll end the course by talking about fallacies. Okay, but that we'll just spend about two weeks on this, two at most three, probably no more than two. Uh, we'll focus on different types of inductive arguments, which are going to be different from the deductive arguments that you learned um, in the last section. Okay, so to help us uh, kind of get into the mode of talking about deductive arguments. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of review on quantifiers. And to do that, we're just going to go over some of the content on page 113. So on page 113, they have somebody uh, giving this sort of speech. Uh, and this is from the reading. And it goes like this. Somebody says, the government's policy is based on the claim that violent offenders reoffend. I resent and refute this claim utterly. My nephew was imprisoned in his late teens on an armed robbery conviction, but unlike a lot of these wasters, he thoroughly sorted himself out. Now he's been married with a steady job for many years, and there's no way he's going to commit a crime again. Okay, so this person is arguing against a government policy based on a certain claim. The claim was that violent offenders reoffend. Now, how did this guy try to argue against it? Well, he said, well, I knew a guy, you know, my nephew, he says, and my nephew was guilty of armed robbery. Uh, but after he got out, he sorted himself out, cleaned himself out, had now has, uh, is, has a family life, has a steady job. Now, the person saying this takes himself to be responding to this. He's saying, uh, this is on page 113, my nephew was a violent reoffender, a violent offender who did not reoffend and will not. Therefore, not all violent offenders reoffend. Okay. Now, where does this guy's reasoning go wrong? Well, it goes wrong because the governmental claim was never that all violent reoffenders, violent offenders reoffend. Nobody has said all. What do they probably mean? They probably meant most or nearly all. Uh, okay. And to refute this sort of claim, you can't refute it just by pointing to one person. Okay. So uh, here's a, a value again of remembering quantifiers and whether we're using a hard generalization which uses all or a soft generalization that reuses most. Okay. Which is uh, yeah, you can't refute a hard generalization by just like, oh, I knew a guy or I knew somebody who, you know, was a violent offender who did not reoffend. Okay, but it's not going to help uh, if they only, they only said most or nearly all. Then you have to use uh, a little, have a little more data to disprove that. Okay, so again, that's just the value of um, noting when a quantifier is not being used and having the best um, interpretation of someone else's quantifier. 
Here's another example of this that applies to recent times. Uh, many people are getting the COVID vaccine right now, and once in a while I'll see a headline saying, um, this person who got the vaccine still got COVID, okay? Um, now, here's where you should just be careful. I could imagine somebody saying, well, look, well, that just means the vaccine's not that uh, effective, okay? But nobody, okay, so let's say, say, vaccine is effective. Now, here's the thing. Nobody was saying vaccine is 100%. Here we're, here's where we would add the quantifier. Nobody was ever saying vaccine is 100% effective. Actually, they're pretty straightforward. You know, like Pfizer is supposed to be like 95 or 90% effective. Uh, Johnson Johnson's a little bit lower. Um, okay. So the, nobody, uh, they were all soft generalizations. And note that if literally millions of people are getting the vaccine every day, you would expect at least some people who got the vaccine to still get infected. Okay. The problem, the thing is, so if like just a few people are getting it out of millions, that's a much better number than otherwise. Um, so that 95% effectiveness is really good. So we, we just should expect it. We shouldn't be that surprised by these news articles. Um, so this is another value of um, watching for the quantifier, paying attention to it. And in this case, they didn't even have a quantifier, violent offenders reoffend. In this case, people actually gave quantifiers. Uh, but it's still, um, people are still missing it. Okay, here's an ex another example the book uses on the value quantifiers for the bottom of page 113. Peter says, you're always late. Sandra says, that's not true. Why do you attack me so? Last Friday I was early. Let's have some champagne, Mr. Grouch. Okay, now uh, Sandra was able to disprove Peter's claim because Peter used the word always when he probably sh uh, shouldn't have. Um, maybe he was just exaggerating again. Sometimes we do talk like this, but it does happen at the expense of truth, and then it makes it easier to refute someone's claim when they make their claim into a hard generalization. Now all Sandra has to do is think of one time where she wasn't late. Um, so really, if Peter wanted to make his claim a little bit more solid and harder to attack, he should have just said you're nearly always late. Okay, then it would take a little bit more work for Sandra to respond to that. Okay, so now this is on the other side. This is the flip side of this example, which is uh, we should be careful of making hard generalizations when we can't support them. Uh, and we tend to do this a lot um, uh, in relationships, especially when we're like kind of um, upset about something. We say, they always do this. They always do that. Or you always do this. Okay. Um, and, and typically, that's probably not true. Um, so that's where we have to be careful about hard generalizations. Um, and the soft generalizations are probably going to be more, uh, pr uh, I guess, uh, attack proof or objection proof. Okay, so that's just a reminder about the value of keeping your quantifiers clear and how soft generalizations are a little bit harder to refute. Okay, let's go on to the next video.